here. Welcome to session three. Um, and that is uh, street level, a future for historic preservation. Um, we all get to have the fun of talking about the amazing presentations we saw and heard today. Um, we've journeyed through a historic distillery, publishing house, a Times Square SRO, a wine bar, a hardware store, and a squash house. Um, to me, they're all about living and working in the historic environment and being inspired by it. This, uh, 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 in front of you, is a stellar panel of broad thinkers with new visions and ideas. Um, talk about pressure. Um, we will discuss um, what we heard today, and uh, we'll bring it home and talk about it and what we've learned and how we can move forward advancing preservation and rethinking preservation. Um, in this um, uh, schedule, before I introduce the panelists, um, uh, four panelists will speak, uh, give a, a brief um, uh, talks about their thoughts. Uh, we'll move into a roundtable discussion, and then we'll have an extensive uh, period of time, almost a half an hour, for audience participation. I know you've all been wanting to speak, and here's your chance. So s save save that up, and and uh, and be sure to speak out when the when the time has come. Um, we have um, our uh, two uh, moderators uh, uh, also joining us in this panel: um, Will Tippins, uh, Fitch trustee and vice president of Related Midwest, uh, the Chicago office of the National Real Estate Firm Related Companies, and on the far um, side is Bill Higgins, Fitch trustee and principal of the New York City historic preservation firm of Higgins and Quaysbarth and Partners. Um, uh, our first uh, uh, speaker, I'm going to uh, introduce everybody at once, is uh, Randy Mason, who's associate professor and chair of the graduate program in historic preservation at the University of Pennsylvania School of Design, and he's a, a major voice in the preservation field. Randy's books include The Once and Future New York on the Origins of Historic Preservation in New York City, and that won uh, the SAH Award. Um, he wrote Giving Preservation a History, and uh, he is about to write a book on the uh, is writing a book on the economics of historic preservation. Um, uh, Randy Mason was uh, Adele would know this uh, at the American Academy of Rome in Rome um, to last year. Um, Alison Eisenberg is is a Fitch Fellow and received an award for her book, which is upcoming on uh, secondhand cities, race and um, uh, region. That can't be right in the uh, antique Americana trade from the Civil War to urban renewal. And she also got uh, support from the Winter Tour Library and the Graham Foundation for that. She is professor of history at Princeton University, where she co-directs the Princeton Mellon Initiative in Architecture, Urbanism, and Humanities um, with Stan Allen. She had a recent book, Downtown America, A History of the Place and the People Who Made It, uh, which received several awards. Um, Allison comes by her broad view through a very diverse experience. Before graduate school, she worked in affordable housing at the Community Preservation Corporation and for New York City Plan uh, Parks and for the New Haven Preservation Trust. Rebecca Chan uh, works at the interface of art, cultural heritage, and community development and is very familiar with a lot of what we heard here today. She is the director of programs for the Baltimore Station North Arts and Entertainment District, where she oversees uh, programming of four public spaces, along with a lot of other initiatives um, aimed at forging and sustaining relationships with artists, designers, residents, and businesses and guiding new development. Rebecca was named one of Baltimore Sun's 2014 10 people to watch under 30. <laughs> um, Adele Chatfield-Taylor, I've, I've had to so ruthlessly cut her, um, her bio here <laughs> that it's barely, everybody knows her and she's done everything and gotten all the awards in the world. Um, <laughs> Adele Chatfield-Taylor is an honorary trustee of the Fitch Foundation. Um, she is president emerita of the American Academy in Rome, and because it's the American Academy, we're, we're saying the proper Latin um, um, ending for that, and served as president and CEO of the Academy uh, up until uh, 2013. She was previously director of the Design Arts Program for the National Endowment for the Arts, and um, 
She was, uh, I'm ruthlessly cutting even more, she was executive director of the New York City Landmarks Preservation Foundation. She has served on many, many boards. I'm going to name one, the U.S. Commission of Fine Arts in Washington, and she has won many awards. And the one I'm going to mention is the cool one, which is uh, in 2002, she was decorated by the President of the Republic of Italy, uh, the Grand Officer of the Ordine al Merito, for doing the unthinkable, making Rome more beautiful through the Historic Preservation of the American Academy in Rome. <laughs> yeah. um, I do want to say that I see many, many people here who could easily be on this panel, and I look forward to our uh, public discussion. Uh, we're going to begin with Randy Mason. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much, Mary, uh, and the, the, for the Fitch Board and Siri for organizing this. That's really, really interesting. I've already learned a lot and uh, started with a fresh notebook this morning, and I'm already many pages into it. Um, and I'm trying to extract a few things that I can try to just start things off in this session and to really have it be a whole room conversation. I realized sometime this afternoon that, in looking back through the program, that um, Apart from Mary, I'm the uh, we, the two of us are the only ones with preservation in our job title, which which um, which scares me a little bit uh, because that makes me speak for a little bit for the preservation field. And I guess I'd, if I was organizing a conference myself, I would call it the reluctant preservationist because uh, I've, I've always had a little bit of uh, and maybe accidental too, of course. I've always had a little bit of. Uh, um, an unkind feeling or, or uncomfortable feeling about the title preservationist uh, for, for reasons I'll get into in a moment. But I think that, you know, given the company that we're keeping today, um, I, I think we're all wearing that label and wearing it with, uh, with a little bit more, um, uh, a little bit more energy and a little bit more optimism, given all the things that we are seeing and hearing and believing as as part of preservation. So the um, the the overall point that that strikes me about the future of preservation, which was sort of our assignment, and all the great things we've heard today, um, is that there's a I think there's a I feel at least a tension and a bit of a conflict between the ways that we think about preservation. Uh, which have changed a lot and evolved a great deal, I think, in the, certainly in the last generation, between the way we think about it and the way that we talk about it and the way that we act on, on, those, on those thoughts. And it came out a few times uh, in the, uh, uh, in, in the uh, especially this morning's session about, you know, well, uh, one of the, the uh, uh, I can't remember who exactly it was, saying, I, well, I, I won't do any project in an historic district because those regulations just relentlessly drag me down. It adds too much time. Um, but I think a lot of the projects actually were, in my mind, case studies of how public and private and NGO and, and other kinds of sweat equity come together in combination to make most good projects, if not all good projects. So um, the, uh, the, the, the truth, I think, in a lot of the, the accumulation of what I heard from the first and second panels is that preservation is not one thing, and that's, I'm just being the master of the obvious in saying that, it's, it's many things, it's many ideas, it's many approach, design approaches, it's many different kinds of organizations, it's many different kinds of outcomes. Sometimes we are preciously protecting and saving and sticking things under glass. Other times we're dramatically transforming uh, a, a building or a place. Uh, so to, to even talk about it with this one word label of preservation, uh, automatically, to me, is uh, we're filling ourselves in, with conflict. Uh, we've got to find more and different ways to talk about uh, this whole range of things that we do and these ideas that we have about the material past, how we activate it for a contemporary society, how we actually take care of it without, uh, without foreclosing our options with, with, by opening options. Uh, and so we need a more open and uh, an adventurous and, and gregarious way of talking about all the stuff that, we, that we're interested in, all the stuff that we heard about today. In addition to those, what you might call traditional curatorial, very professional ways of taking care of certain uh, parts of heritage or certain heritage places. So we, we, we need to encompass uh, all those things. On the other hand, uh, the way that we talk about, the way that we in preservation talk about preservation, the way that other people talk about us, um, I think more, but much more often fall into, uh, under a category I would call fundamentalist. Uh, you know, we, we are not admitting of other ways of, of hearing about what we do or, or hearing other people tell us how we should be doing it or, 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 or uh, just having a discussion about it. We, we far too quickly get into uh, defensive position 
I've said this before to those of you who know me, we've, you know, the battle metaphors, I'm like, come on. We've been, we, this has been going on for more, you know, centuries. We've been talking about battles and campaigns and fights, and you know, there are other ways to think about and model how we want to get along. Um, and of course, other people pick fights with us, so it's not always inappropriate, but I think we just need to call attention to the habit we have of, of more or less fundamentalist thinking about preservation. I would also say that we're, not a, we're in good company because the people who we are often, quote unquote, in battle with or in, in, uh, in communication with have their own fundamentalist ways of thinking about their enterprises. So whether it's uh, the, the very uh, fundamentalist and polarized politics that we, our elected officials practice these days or uh, people in the media, whether it's the very fundamentalist ways of thinking about economic development that people practice these days. I'm from Atlantic City and so I, I, I wear I bear heavily the weight of my, uh, my community's decision to go for casinos as the economic development decision in the 1970s and look where, look where it got the city. Um, that is a, a classic example of, uh, of uncreative, fundamentalist, single-minded thinking about how to solve a problem. We can do better. Uh, and the people in these other fields need to be taught to do better. I feel now I just should just repeat the, the maxim that Vic uh, Christensen, is that the gentleman's name this morning? Uh, um, the uh, the gentleman who with the confectionery, um, you know, it's morally indefensible to eat in chain restaurants, right? <laughs> So make the food analogy to preservation. Uh, there, there are lots of different ways that we eat, lots of different ways that we think about food. We have to think about the historic environment and cultural memory and all these, these things that are our goals to protect and, and, and communicate uh, in those terms as well. We can't just go for the chain version of preservation uh, or the, you know, the sort of fundamentalist versions of preservation. We also have to have these more uh, open and adventurous uh, versions of it. Um, so, uh, in addition to sort of being more open and being more uh, uh, engaging with uh, about our own ideas and, and with other people's ideas, uh, I think we need to, uh, if, we're, if we're really going to think about the future in, in a, that kind of open way and the long-term future of the preservation field, 50 years from now, let's say, I think we have to entertain the, the option or the, the, uh, the possibility and maybe even a desirable possibility that if we're really successful, uh, that preservation will actually cease to exist as some self-defined, in air quotes, uh, field, or, or as some people actually call it, a discipline. I actually don't think it should be a discipline. I think it should be something that should be a means to lots of other ends, as many of the uh, previous speakers have said today. Uh, so let's think about that long-term future as not just a, a bigger version of what we've got now, but maybe a transformed version. Uh, thank you. I add my thanks. This is a, a fantastic topic for the forum, and um, and the panels today were really stunning. Um, what I'd like to do is offer a couple of themes. I'm going to start with a few ideas and themes that uh, jumped out to me from the first panel, and then a few from the second panel, and then a few cumulative questions. I I hope for uh, discussion. One that emerged to me from the first panel is perhaps in front of us today we have almost a generational question, namely um, probably many of you noted that the, the people who were coming to the new uh, you know, office parks and artist destinations were very young um, that were being created in, for example, St. Louis or Troy, but the individuals of the community who were bringing forward the historical artifacts and the memories of those communities uh, were, were stretching back further. That was clearly kind of a 1960s, 1950s, 1940s um, community. And so I, I wonder what, what, how that plays out right now in the field of preservation. What kind of generational differences, divides um, are we witnessing? Um, uh, so then, um, the, uh, a second question is one that I think Anne brought up from the audience, which is, if we're, if we're observing more and more this kind of accidental preservation and, and what we might see as an organic evolution where somebody comes into a neighborhood and they become a preservationist, um, how do we deal with the difficult past? And in, in, in some ways that's raised when you look at, for example, um, old corner stores, uh, they, they both tap into an amazing resource and history of a community 
But depending on where you live, it also might be uncovering, for example, the history of racial segregation. Um, so how does a community step into the more difficult paths that are likely to emerge as, alongside the inspiring and celebratory uh, paths? So that I think um, I agree with Anne that that's an important uh, topic to think about. Then as, as one of the historians here, I also would, it, my, I kept jumping back to the 1960s. And there are some ways in which the language we're using here of um, of outliers and accidental preservation, I think fall on either side of a 1960s divide where you know you might pinpoint a heating up of gentrification, the role of urban renewal, and also the acceptance of preservation as one of the driving economic forces. You know, it begins to build by the 1970s and the 1980s. It becomes ensconced and 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 valued as economic development. So. Uh, when who are the outliers? I guess is what I'm I'm wondering because like when I read material from the 1960s, I have this great um, exchange between one of the organizers at an uh, American um, Institute for Architects conference, uh, who's always been responsible in 1967 for the historic preservation panel, and he wrote to. Uh, Lawrence Halperin, a landscape architect who was one of the uh, people behind Ghirardelli Square. It's 1967 and he writes to Halperin, he says, thank you for, for your participation in our historic preservation panel here at the AIA meeting, because your participation means that we've been moved from the pre-dawn meeting slot, and now we've been moved more into the center of the discussion you know, at the AIA, and that preservation was being taken seriously as an aspect, in this case, of urban design. So I think that question of who are the outliers is very much raised here, um, you know, maybe from an era when preservationists really were more the outliers, um, and, and so what has changed and who is outside that. And secondly, the accidental, because I think that in a kind of post-gentrification, um, urban renewal era, that we might accidentally come to preservation, but the, the, the questions are not accidental. Like we all know that gentrification is a looming problem. And um, I think that it was Gina who used the term uh, intentionality, you know, that there's really, you know, you, you, you kind of know that that's coming as, a, as an issue um, when you're working in preservation. So uh, I think in many ways, the topic that I would love to hear more discussion of most forcefully is how one differentiates uh, between a discussion of buildings and a discussion of land value. I, I, to me, that's behind a lot of the conversation. Like when you're working in the, um, the Navy Yard or the Presidio, there's not a, a particular challenge of um, you know, the property values in the same way as when you're working in Troy or, you know, or St. Louis or Detroit. And so the, the, how, how it, when we use the terminology of investment as we have today, what, how, does, how do land values factor into the models of, of preservation and shape? Um, we talk a lot about the buildings, but what's happening with the land? And I think that, that I think preservationists in many ways, accidental or not, can offer a lot on that, I think, really uh, critical discussion. Um, then I, I, you can't help but notice that it, what kinds of, are there difference, differences between residential and commercial? It's, it's very s simple. I mean, some of the cases are rooted so much in a residential neighborhood that we heard from. Some are completely rooted in the commercial. You know, what, where, what's the future with that? You know, is it just the, the mixing of the two? Are there implications? Um, I, it seems like that is uh, a, a point of, um, of flux right now. And um, uh, let's see. I guess the last, the last um, kind of something that I was really fascinated with was the language of new ideas. And I found that the, co the question that came up in the most recent discussion about defining artists um, and why we turn to artists as such a core representative of the creative class and the ways in which other segments of the population are tapped or identified as creative, to me also gets to that question of where do the new ideas come from in something like 
you know, what are the ideas that are familiar? Um, there was the reference to using, um, uh, uh, let's see, I guess it was, I think it was in um, looking at the um, Brownsville public housing where Roseanne explained that it was a very Jane Jacobs model, you know, that, um, that they were using. And uh, thanks, there's that bright red stop yeah. sign. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Allison. Happily, that's my last point. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, where do the new ideas come from and who brings them in and what role do artists play or not play in that? Thank you very much. Rebecca. Great, so I have a lot of, this over. I have a lot of ideas swirling around my, in my head um, and I'm coming at this mostly as a practitioner, both in the art field, but I also do have a background in historic preservation. People often ask me what I'm doing working for an arts and entertainment district um, and having the degree I have. And I usually try to explain to them that I'm sort of like a, a covert or sort of ninja preservationist. Um, but in observing you know, the activity that's happening within our district, which is about 100 acres in Baltimore and happens to overlap with two National Register and two local historic districts, um, one thing, oh, well, I'll circle back to that point, um, but I really think that the, one of the biggest challenges um, in thinking about spaces, places, and the people that occupy them in the context of historic preservation and creative placemaking um, is that access to affordable and code compliant space for living and working artists is one of the largest threats facing the creative industries and artists um, as a field. And I think that we as preservationists are expertly suited actually um, to sort of tackle this challenge, um, both at the policy level. So for example, um, in the arts district that I work in, um, there is an incentive that is aimed directly at um, developers who are working on art spaces. But what we're finding is that people are using historic tax credits when they go after um, large redevelopment projects for artistic use. Um, Another thing that I think is really interesting too, and this is something that Anne sort of touched on um, in her talk about creative placemaking, sort of the larger grant programs that are cropping up across the country, um, is that these projects are using um, federal funding. So um, increasingly arts organizations um, are coming in contact with sort of section 106 review. Um, I, for example, have um, managed two, actually three national endowment for the arts grants now, and every time we've had to undergo um, both Section 106 review for those projects, but also um, local historic district review. Um, and that's been good for us because I have this background and I know how to sort of um, talk to both parties, both the preservationists and the artists that we're working with. Um, but I think that this is going to be a challenge and certainly in thinking about the future of preservation um, and as these two fields um, commingle increasingly, um, something that we're gonna have to think about at a policy level. Um, finally, I thought it was really interesting um, in the second panel um, when we talked about unmaking places, creative placemaking, and then I would actually offer even a third um, component to that, and it's something that I think that we as preservationists will also be um, interested in is the idea of creative place saving. Um, so the goals of sort of creative placemaking um, and uh, placemaking, which has long been sort of a, um, you know, an something that is interested preservationists. Um, these goals include cultural resiliency, strengthening, strengthening local economies, and quality of life. Um, so those are shared goals, but I think our strategies are a little bit different. Um, and so I'm interested, and I'm um, interested to hear what the panel says as well, um, about how we can borrow um, tools from both of these disciplines um, in enacting, or sort of uh, working towards those goals, achieving those goals. <laughs> Um, I'm delighted to be last because I think it gives me a chance to say as I'm looking at Martika Sowen Fitch, how much Fitch would have loved this uh, day. It, it was right up his alley. He would have been, as I am, uh, very grateful to the organizers who chose the participants and then the participants. I mean, it was the really fantastic choices and that uh, provided this opportunity to cover this territory. Fitch would have liked the term accidental as he loved the, and always started his classes in the fall talking about the importance of the amateur preservationist. And by that he did not mean uh, dilettante, which is what the word seems to have evolved into meaning now, but instead the true root of the word, which means people who, do, who work for nothing on projects out of love, 
of what they're doing. And um, he was also very, very uh, faithful about bringing up the importance of women in the invention of preservation and the practice of preservation back in those days because it was the women who cherished their cities and it was out of love that they were the first to rise up and rescue parts of Providence, Annapolis, Charleston, Miami Beach, Denver, you name it. Uh, what Fitch was really interested in, though, that I think has survived all these generations of his uh, teaching and now teaching from the beyond, is he always wanted to raise the level of the debate. And I think um, today is a great example of what happens when you really do mix it up and bring in people who haven't been in the conversation, at least as far as I knew. Uh, I, I, I assume that that's somewhat true of all of us. The wonderful thing about the panels um, was that many of the speakers are not professional preservationists, but working on instinct and common sense. Um, asking the building, in many cases, to tell them what it wants to be, this old building. I, I always refer to this to myself as the purloin letter approach to preservation. Um, as you strip back layer by layer and uh, react to what they find and what they're discovering as artists would rather than as technicians or lawyers might. Um, I've written down here, as Roseanne said, looking at the fabric of a city in a new way. And both she and Jamie certainly gave good evidence of that. I found myself hoping that there's a way that their stories can be shared very, very broadly because I think it'll do us old time preservationists a lot of good and give us a lot of credit um, that these things are also preservation that are happening and they're so important um, and these approaches are so different. And sometimes they're phased out uh, over a very, very long time um, but I think being associated with preservation means that they're okay and even inspired in many cases. So we'd like to see more press for these wonderful projects. This leads me to a comment on what Jason said, which is that he would be staying away from the locally designated buildings because of the reg regulation. Randy's touched on this. I think our process uh, of regulating designated buildings has to be revolutionized but not discontinued and that's a very urgent, uh, it's a crisis for us in New York and I think in many other cities. It's the nature of corporations and government um, that they lean towards standardizing everything they're doing whether it's with old buildings or not but um, that's not what's called for in every case and it has a tendency to make the historic building a backdrop rather than a uh, sort of true vessel of, of an ongoing life, which is the way a lot of us see it. I loved the fact of um, the community coming forward in the instances of the confectionery, the Lucas confectionery, and in the fortune-telling bar, because it reminded me of uh, what the public hearings used to be like when people would appear to talk about the need to designate someone, some something or preserve it. This is mostly sort of pre-tax act when there was no tax act. So it was a much more gentle operation, this whole um, preservation thing. And it wasn't so associated with commerce, which is a good, it's a good development, the tax act, but it, it was a very different atmosphere. Um, I think the number of speakers we had uh, talking about the point of view of the artists and the artist contributions here is um, an ingredient that cannot be overstated because uh, they don't use the term historic preservation, but I think the same thing that strikes us preservationists is what strikes them. I also uh, happen to think that preservation is in a certain way a, an art form, so that it 
has to be dealt with by instinct and by emotion and by a lot of things other than just technical know-how. Um, and the most important thing about what I learned today is just the common sense to using, to, to reusing these buildings, to responding to the fact that they are part of a context that is, is, is viewed as permanent as long as they are there, and that they shouldn't be wasted, and that the, the fact that they are meaningful in that form to their communities is something that is uh, so desperately important that um, it, it was wonderful to hear it talked about here today. And that we all wind up being preservationists. Um, two minutes, I see. But that really what we're talking about here is shared values. Bill talked about wanting to be in uncharted territory, and I think we're on the verge, Bill, so I think that's a very good sign. Lots of people have referred to the problem of the name of historic preservation. Um, it, I think what some of you who are, are younger than some of my generation are is what, what it's wonderful to see is uh, how much it has evolved since we first got involved. I mean, it, in its way, historic preservation is as revolutionary and as tenacious and it's as important, but really as revolutionary as the idea of progress was. When I was very, very young, the real reason you couldn't save a building was it was standing in the way of progress. And I don't think people talk that way anymore or think that way. But it does take a long, long time to get over that kind of religion that was really dominating the world after World War II. Um, but while we're on the topic of what, what to call it, um, because it seems so narrow, and it seems to be about freezing a building or an artifact in time and in the past in a way that really isn't intended, it really, uh, what we need is a term that implies that there is a narrative there with many dimensions, including history, architecture, landscape, the entire context, when Christina and I were working on Rome, we also wanted that story to be able to include the library, the research, the writing, the food, the making of art, all of the things that it had taken place in our place at the Academy. And that it's an ever-evolving community that has an association with that place. Uh, and the timelessness of the place and the aliveness. I think that's the thing we respond to and that's the thing the non-quote preservationists respond to when they see the, t the sign for the fortune teller bar and they realize that there's something there that can be built upon. Um, that a place cannot just be about the past and I don't think any self-respecting preservation uh, preservationists would, would recommend that, but on a, an ongoing, particular, minute civilization that has a soul and a future and a capacity to be enhanced by new additions that grow out of its continuity, um, that are always somehow based within the continuity, within the parameters of the existing place. So it, start, it does take time, but I don't think we should worry too much about the, the name, Historic Preservation, because as long as there's sort of a flag sticking up and we can all know we that's the place we belong, I think it's effective. So I would let it rest at that point. Thank you very much, Adele. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs>
and he used to talk about the ladies of Mount Vernon, and, um, that the historic part was really important in the historic preservation part, but the historic part has become somewhat less important and the preservation part has become more important, you know, the, uh, uh, preserving the fabric. Uh, but what, I've, what I heard at the sessions this morning was the community was more interested in the historic part. Um, and um, I'm throwing that out to you. Uh, what do you think about that? What should we do with that? Uh, how do we relate to the community better uh, with this in mind? Um, Brandy. And then... <laughs> um, it's like getting a pop quiz, I suppose. Yes. Uh, so I guess my, my short answer would be that uh, I think one of the things that the field has really uh, made manifest over the last couple of generations is that, is that there's more than one kind of authenticity, more than one kind of meaning, and more than one kind of function that we, we've learned to not just expect but demand out of historic places. It's not just about um, you know, representing a certain moment in artistic uh, creation. It's also about, you think, I think of the Main Street program as my sort of my default example of, you know, that's about preserving the viability of a, of a small town's downtown as a commercial place. Mm -hmm. And preservation of buildings is the means to that end. I think there are, there are a lot of examples, um, up to and including all, many of the ones we heard about today, where the preservation of uh, form and fabric and, and, and architectural function is the, is the means to achieve these other ends, affordable housing, solving homelessness, and, and so on. I think that's something that we can really uh, find as a great contribution that we can continue making. Uh, and really build on that as uh, as the, um, the you know, whatever, whatever we call ourselves. Um, that's that's the core cap one of the core capabilities that we have. And we can keep contributing that to more and more different other causes. I think I would also I would add in terms of looking forward that um, that I I have hopes that there's there are better and better connections now between the professional historical industry and the local historical industry or you know state preservation organizations and that um, you know anyone who's done local historical research at whatever scale you know whether it's Brooklyn or Troy um, knows that there's a huge amount of knowledge that resides locally and there's always community historians but I don't think that that connector between the um, you know the the academy and the universities has necessarily always been that great with local history. But um, even in New Jersey, uh, I've worked at Rutgers for 10 years and now I'm at Princeton, um, I, I, it's been improving just in 10 years that, for example, the state uh, prizes for um, new work in the history of New Jersey is, is getting a much better circulation back and forth with the places that teach that history. Um, so, and that actually ultimately comes back to preservation. Um, like a book gets written, I remember teaching a course, uh, in, a, uh, in a history course um, at Rutgers, a book uh, called Sam Patch, The Famous Jumper, and it, it touched a lot on Patterson, and apparently there was a new museum in Patterson, and this student had interned there, and she said to me, I work at this museum, but we don't know this history. And I explained, that's one of the ways sometimes that the knowledge has to get out there to go back to those institutions. So I think that maybe that community response that um, you're describing, that maybe the flows are, are hopefully gonna be stronger going forward. Any, Bill? <laughs> I think um, the, the part that fascinates me is the uh, is the community uh, involvement um, and what what Fred described as uh, n not necessarily that we're moving away from the buildings, uh, but that we're moving toward the people, um, toward the the human side of this. I mean, I I, I think th there's a fundamental paradox um, about the uh, the history and preservation, and physical preservation side of things, because it's always, sorry about my Catholic upbringing, but I always think about the body and, and, and the soul. <laughs> um, you know, we are, 
very concerned, as we should be, about preserving the body and doing the right thing by the physical vessel. But there is all of this stuff, history and culture and all of these things, that somehow, in some mysterious way, resides in the physical vessel. And I believe that we're trying to get at that um, through what we do with the physical vessel. And I feel that um, with a greater emphasis perhaps now on the community and what people are doing with the buildings and thinking about the buildings, maybe we're going to put the physical vessel in, in, a, in a better um, perspective. And we're going to realize that it's not just the physical vessel we're trying to work with and keep alive, it's what it contains as well. You know, um, thinking about what Adele said about progress and how, you know, when the preservation movement started, it was in a period in which progress meant demolition. And uh, I think what the, 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 the game changer here is that uh, society is doing a much better job of respecting the existing fabric as something that's worth... Uh, considering as we move forward. And it's not just from the preservation standpoint, but you know, it's the environmentalists as well. You know, we shouldn't be putting these things in the landfill and the like. And I think that's with uh, the main streets as a good example, potentially being under less threat from just complete demolition because our society is more accepting now that in fact progress doesn't require that to happen that it's actually opening our opportunity to think more uh, about the other pieces of this other than simply the protection of the vessel, uh, which, was, which was what we had to do when there was, uh, the, there was urban renewal and the removal of entire neighborhoods. You know, If you think about the Chicago Housing Authority or all of these housing authorities and Robert Moses, what was there before that towers were neighborhoods that were erased then and then we've come in and we've, as Jamie pointed out, erased them again. And I think now that we're actually in a place when you think about what everybody is, uh, has been talking about today is, you know, the best preservation of these resources is success. And how that success comes is a myriad of different ways, whether it's through affordable housing, through artists, through individuals coming in and taking on a building. And maybe that's where we get to this point where thinking about the Secretary of Interior standards and the, the issues of working with local commissions, we need to accept that in fact, we succeed in preservation if what we breed is success. And we should do our best to find that balance between the preservation of the vessel and the opportunity to do with it what needs to be done for vibrancy, for bringing community back and the like. Missy, just a quick footnote. I'm sure that in the, in the case of Detroit where they wanted to take that building down, it's because they wanted to signal that they were doing something about it. It had nothing to do with the merits of the building and it's a holdover from the urban renewal, you know, that that showed progress in their dealing with it. And um, I, I think we're at a moment when maybe the balance is tipping that it won't be so necessary to prove for the municipality to, approve, to prove that they're getting on with it by tearing the building down. I mean, it's just such a ludicrous um, thing to do. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca. I guess the issue that I'm thinking about then if we're talking about vessels and occupying these buildings is what to do in cities in which the population is far less than um, it was built out for. Um, so when you just physically don't have enough people or Bad occupants. Bad <laughs> Bad <laughs> um, and immigration. I, yeah, like immigration. Um, so I guess that's more of a, another challenge to the rest of the panel. To, well, Baltimore is one. The Fitch Foundation gave mm -hmm. a grant for the row houses of Baltimore many years ago, and one of the reasons was because that 
uh, author was uh, trying to stop them from tearing down every other row house in Baltimore neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And that is not happening now. So, can I make one more comment yes. on, on, on row houses since Philadelphia's got, arguably oh. Philadelphia has as many or more abandoned <laughs> uh, row houses than, uh, than Baltimore. One of the, to think in terms of uh, the sort of performance or the function of, uh, of row house neighborhoods, um, they're supposed to house working class, middle class people, and they no longer do that. Um, and the, the, it's a very difficult problem to try to square their, their uh, significance as architectural and historical artifacts or embodiments of a certain moment in history, and their, their underperformance, to put it mildly, as uh, adequate housing. Uh, and so we're, we're working in a neighborhood in West Philly at the moment where the folks there, as, we as our students talk to them on their front porches, say, uh, well, I'm so old that uh, it's going to be you know, not much more time that I can actually get upstairs to where the only bathroom is in my row house. And that, then we need to intervene a little bit more strenuously, and, we, and we, we can't just be guided by our traditional preservation chops. And that's also where I would add the question of ownership or stewardship, because those large multifamily buildings, whether it's public housing or the flop houses or the SROs, those were owned by a, a single entity, whereas the row houses Part of the problem is that even if you're trying to collect them all back through tax delinquency, that's a, a, already a massive investment of resources. So I think in, in part it's a little bit about the question of scale. Um, but it does remind us too of the vast differences between cities that are you know, so-called threatened by gentrifications. And I know it's a cliche, but the, all the other places that wish they had gentrification, but just to signal that there are places that would just love to have the problem of that increasing you know, population and, and property value. And Rebecca, do you think that the creative placemaking can um, do anything on this uh, front? I think it can help, but it's, not, it's by nature a multi-sector approach, and so um, I think it's going to depend on the partners who are at the table in that case. What but it is about stimulating interest in a place and building on existing assets, so I, I think it's a good start. I think, I think part of the sheer um, delight of what Gina was talking about in terms of her and her neighbor's project in Detroit, it, I mean, it's, it's a tragedy that cities are contracting and population is gone, uh, et cetera. However, the other side of that coin is that there is extra space and a building can be, become an artwork that doesn't have to have a high value on the market. There can be a wonderful old abandoned, previously abandoned store that now just becomes a place where you can sit and talk and you can sit and think. I mean, that is a, in a city like New York, uh, that is a virtually a bizarre idea that there would be <laughs> that kind of space sitting around to do creative things with. And just quickly, I, w I would suggest that um, s that and so much of what's been said today is pure Jane Jacobs. Um, once again, as if she needed to be proven right again. You know, this idea that when there is extra space, there is cheap space, there is sort of semi-forgotten space, all kinds of creative things, margin fin financially, economically marginal, but culturally rich creative things um, can, can be done. It's, it's, a, it's a tragedy what's happened many of our cities, but part of what we heard today was the beginnings of a route toward um, uh, doing something with them that is not just turning them all into you know, corporate profit. <laughs> I think we're going to open it up to our audience. <laughs> oh, and we've got a lot of... Andrew raised his hand first. <laughs> so, so first off, I, I want to say I thought this was a fantastic day. I would say this is one of the best conferences that I've been to. I thought everyone was really compelling. But I have a few things that have come up that I would just want to comment on. One is this notion that preservationists are not, have not been interested in people. And I just have to say that I think that is 100% incorrect and that Jim Fitch would be very upset to hear that. We've always been interested in people and the idea that buildings have lives uh, and it, the people that go through these buildings uh, help to create 
what it is that we love about, about buildings and communities. And I completely reject this notion that we're now suddenly moving to a concern for people and community. I think we were always about that. And you just talked to, in the early days, I'm old enough to remember when, you know, brownstoning was a big thing and it was about community and saving these, these communities. And I think that that's really important to remember. Um, another thing that I, I, and the one thing that I think I found uh, that I would have to criticize the conference for is we've been to St. Louis, we've been to Chicago, we've been to Brownsville, um, we've been to Detroit, we've been to Troy, and I want to know where are the minority community activists today talking to us. Um, it's mostly we've been hearing from people from the, who came from the outside into these communities, and I would really like to know what community people think about some of these ideas about um, accidental preservation. Um, another thing that relates to my first comment is that in many ways, um, everything old is new again. And I'm looking at artists, artisans, outliers, activists, and I'm thinking, especially the artist issue, I'm thinking about, I, I did a talk a few years ago about Donald Judd as, the, as a leader in the preservation of Soho. Um, and that, that, the, that a lot depends, I think, on the place and that Detroit and St. Louis and Troy are sort of where New York was 30 or 40 years ago. And so there is, the, the economy's down and these groups are now coming in again. Uh, and it's, it's, I think it's fantastic that they are, but it's so interesting to see how certain things are repeating um, o over time. And um, the last thing I'd like to say is that I wish we were living in the world in which um, preservation was not accused of standing in the way of progress. Uh, but I don't believe I live in that world. All I have to do is read what the, the, the propaganda from the Real Estate Board of New York that thinks that we are standing in the way of progress uh, and we are not really challenging that view very well. I think about the demolition of the Purchase Building in the Dumbo Historic District where the Parks Department accused preservationists of not being a value that was important as they were and that we were standing in the way of progress and we lost that building. And, and I, hope, I hope to see the day when, when that's not true, but I, I, don't, I personally have not seen it yet. So those are my comments. Panelists, <laughs> did anyone want to uh, speak on, uh, you're, not, you're not, I'll just move on to, the, uh, to David Abrams. <laughs> Thanks, I, first I'd just like to offer a definition and it's Fitch's that I've shared with a couple of my colleagues during the day. Uh, the definition, he, he referred to this field as the retrieval and the recycling of the built environment. He did it for a couple of reasons. One, it, it added a, a sort of technical overlay, uh, and that's uh, instead of the more sort of amorphous, uh, uh, loaded term of preservation. And I think it's one that uh, fits appropriately. It may not deal with all the issues and all the challenges. I want to second Andrew's observations, and I think poverty and race are critical in, in the discussion, and as someone who, whose office, uh, I had my office for 35 years in Newark, uh, the, uh, it's not simply, uh, it, it's, it's more than, you know, hearing from the people, you know, the, 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 not the other side of the stories we heard, but, you know, the, the side of the people who were there, but it, we, we have to look around at, we, there are no people of color in the audience and the panels, uh, it's, this is not a, this is, you know, a criticism of where we are. If we're to move ahead and be a meaningful part, a real meaningful part of a country which very shortly will be majority minority, we've got to do something. I don't know what the something is, but that to me is the critical challenge that we all face. As a, um, as a helpful metaphor, um, made me think of perhaps a more apt term um, for those of you in this niche who are struggling with the phrase historic preservation, it just popped into my head, perhaps historic regeneration, since most of the discussions were about repurposing and recycling and t to some degree recycling for um, the improvement of lives. Regeneration refers both to body and soul in many practices, science included, and spirituality. And certainly in our lives, we regenerate all the time when we have to... Um, rebuild ourselves. So in reference to rebuilding communities and buildings, um, perhaps historic regeneration. So I really found when Randy's comment very compelling when he said about um, 
that he doesn't like preservation, to think of preservation as a discipline, and that someday he hopes it will not be a discipline. And I know I've, over the years I've talked with Missy many times, and Missy has always has, has been very strong on the notion that of preservation as a, a professional field and the need for uh, professional standards. Um, so I just want to ask people what they think of, of this dichotomy uh, between the, the preservation as a, a discipline or, or not a discipline. I think that's a really was a really compelling um, uh, idea that was brought up. Can I start there? So um, I, I wanted to I want to start this actually because it, it, it's a segue and it's going back uh, Andrew to your first comment about preservationists always thinking about the people and it's always been about the people and I actually think that fundamentally the regulation of preservation is not about the people at all. It is about the bricks and mortar and isn't about success of community. And the battles that we as developers have often aren't about, um, are, are, they, they come down to bricks and mortar because quite honestly they do sometimes come down to dollars and cents. And the success of a project and its ability to succeed often can be stymied by the regulation of preservation, which is not about the people. So we can go in and we, we do, we couple low-income housing tax credits and historic tax credits all the time. And we can go into a community and what makes our job of providing affordable housing difficult and taking communities that need to be managed better um, and need to be, have changes made to them makes it difficult is actually the regulation of historic preservation. And this is where it gets to that point of preservation isn't about people. So when you get to the practitioner point of view and whether there should be or not, I do think that there is, um, there is actually a lack of the, um, in, when, when you look at what, what the, what the, um, opportunities are as a preservationist. What do they do? What do people do that come out with preservation degrees? They become, they're often architects, they're preservation consultants to help you through the tax credit process, et cetera. They're not out there. The, the trained preservationists rarely are the people in the trenches in the field trying to make communities, uh, you know, better, like what Gina is trying to do or the work that Jamie has been doing. And so, um, while I don't think that there should be a, um, while I think that getting rid of people that understand how the, the preservation of the buildings, I think that actually um, there is a potential that the way that we perceive it and the way that it gets regulated, in fact, is very limiting and doesn't help the profession or the movement. I would have... Um, Rebecca, I would have to disagree in part with that because I actually do have a background in preservation and I found that um, thinking of it as more of a, a worldview as I approach my daily practice, which does involve working directly with community members, community associations, um, people living and working in an arts district, but one that is also you know, a residential area in a commercial district as well. Um, and I certainly do see how the regulation of preservation um, can sometimes be a hindrance to some of the um, development um, that happens in the neighborhood. Um, overall, I think it's a very necessary point of view to be bringing to the table. Frank. So I've been listening to this all day, and I think one thing that um, seems to be very true is that we're all celebrating anniversaries here. We're celebrating. 50 years, really, of preservation in many ways. And the field has changed a lot. So it's true that the regulatory system probably will have to change in historic preservation. But somebody had to do it when it was done, or everything would have been wiped out now. So while what I was wondering when I heard that first panel especially, who were accidental preservationists, and I'm looking at the product, 
what was up there on the screen. And it was all so appropriate. And I kept thinking, well, if they're accidental, where did they learn that? So I think the way I've answered it for myself over the course of these couple of hours is that probably the effect of the preservation movement at this point has trickled outside the professionals and generally affected the judgment of the accidentals who are now doing great work. There, there was no injustice to any building that I saw up on the screen. And I, I don't know how else to explain that. So maybe, in fact, there's been an enormous effect of the regulatory process or the stiffness or something over all these years that's now manifested itself in that way and, may, and which supports the argument that the regulation process of historic preservation 50 years into the game is, is ready for a change. And I think, excuse me, one of the things that worked there was a deliberate attempt to welcome the community into their spaces. This was true of the uh, fortune-telling bar as well as um, the Lucas confectionery, I think. <laughs> and that both invites comments and I think at least one of them who was presenting one of those uh, projects said that they learned a lot from the community. <coughs> and I think that's something new, actually, that, that, that that atmosphere in this place where nobody was in a hurry and they let the building teach them and they invited the community in and the community started leaving these postcards or whatever. I think that's different. It was much more of a um, defiant act in the past, and the community wasn't invited in, in the early, early days, I don't think. So that's a very positive thing. Just one woman's opinion. So I've been part of a neighborhood association that acted not unlike a preservation commission. I've also been the chair of my preservation commission in my town. Um, and they were doing design review. And this thing happened where someone said that their design should be accepted because they used to babysit for the guy who did all of the great renovation of the historic houses in the neighborhood. And I said, no, it doesn't work like that. It's not subjective, it's objective. You have to review things, you can't hide the design underneath, you can't sit on the design and not let everybody else in the room see the design, which actually happened um, uh, at, at a meeting. You know, you, you have to have objective rules. And I think that <coughs> happens at local design and historic preservation com commission review levels, which I think is why people come out saying they don't want to have anything to do with it. And I think a lot of times, at least in my experience, that's been what has been difficult for people. Um, but it, when you have your Tax Act review and when you have your Section 106 review, it tends to be uh, a little bit more objective. And I wanted to respond to what um, something Rebecca said about uh, her ability to respond to both the art side and the Section 106 side on reviewing projects. I've been in that position several times. And then linking to um, what uh, Randall was saying about uh, not being fearful and defensive as a preservationist. And when I get in those situations that you were describing, Rebecca, um, where there's going to be a historic building as part of a project and people immediately say, oh, historic building, oh. And I immediately say, no, no, it's okay. It's a good thing. And in part I say it because this is my background, I know how to handle it. But I also don't, 
want to jump to that defensive position, but, but um, make sure that everybody understands that it is um, a benefit to the project, that it's gonna make it a better project. Um, so it's just uh, you know, really great to hear the, the way that you all are talking about that. Thanks, um, I'm Dan Campo, I teach, uh, I'm a professor at the School of Architecture and Planning at Morgan State University in Baltimore. Great, great program, uh, really enjoyed it. And um, I think my question has to do with uh, trying to get the, the panel's reaction to what we heard in the morning and sort of balancing that with traditional ideas about community engagement, which seems to be uh, an issue that's been come up in, in this discussion. And uh, I've been doing historic preservation research. Very, uh, my case studies are in uh, Buffalo, Detroit, and Brooklyn. And uh, I'm calling this uh, DIY preservation, insurgent preservation, sub-market preservation. I'm kind of, I'm exploring. I don't know 100% where I'm going with it. But what I found is that much like the, the panelists in the morning, um, the preservation protagonists, and, and many of them are amateurs, uh, make a whole bunch of decisions quite quickly responding to opportunities and constraints as they come up. So it's very um, tactical, it's very ad hoc, uh, it's entrepreneurial, right? And they work in a, a vacuum of, for the most part, a vacuum of resources, so they have to be. Um, but in doing that, the typical or conventional ways that we engage local residents is sort of bypassed, right? So there is, a, there is a very strong engagement, but the engagement is ad hoc. So people kind of join the coalition of people who are doing these projects, involved in these projects, um, involved in their events, and so on. Um, but there's definitely, especially in Detroit, you know, there's a, that conflict about, um, well, how come the, the community hasn't been contacted by this, right? And I think if you look at the two panels from the morning and the afternoon, you know, the, there was probably a lot more community outreach and engagement in those public housing demolitions than there were in, even if it was just on face value, right, than in the uh, tactical approaches of the morning uh, presentations. I just wanted to get the panel's reaction to that. Uh, you know, uh, I think also what I did want to say was, I don't know a lot of the panelists aren't here, but the, the panelists that are here, um, please, you, you, you should feel free to speak. And you, 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 you're allowed. Yes. <laughs> well, as, as a panelist who's also a developer, um, you know, I think, you know, there's a comment about, you know, wanting to or not wanting to participate in a project that's located in a historic district. You know, I think that establishment of a district that's protecting the integrity of a, na of a neighborhood, you know, establishes a community good that the developer needs to respect. And, and you need to come in and you need to participate in a process even if it's difficult, and that's part of doing work in that kind of a setting. Um, I do think that there needs to be some type of shift in the regulation of historic preservation to recognize what we've been talking about, which is the people part versus the building part. And I, I've encountered it, and I've encountered it both in the definition of what we consider historic, as well as, and that's really where I've encountered it, there's a second piece, which is the regulation of what you do with the building once you've defined it as historic. I, I think that, the, I personally think there's more need to move on that first part than perhaps the second part. Um, I'll give you a very concrete example. In, in a rural Minnesota town, we were doing a, a historic rehabilitation of a school building. And in Minnesota, there seems to be a feeling that schools are common and therefore not historic. And despite the fact that every single person in this town of 13,000 had experienced and lived in that building, the way that we were required to document its historic significance was as a building that happened to include intact representation of three different generations of educational architecture. And so there was no recognition of the historic nature of the community's involvement within, with that building over a hundred years of occupancy. It was entirely based on the, on the architectural features 
of three distinct you know, periods of, of educational construction. And I, I think that, that while we were able to obtain documentation of the historic nature of that building, I, I think it was disrespectful in a way of the human part of that building's life. And I, I don't know what you do about that, but I, I think that, that as I listen to this conversation about the human element versus the architectural element, I think that there's room for movement there. And I think that that's probably something new over, over the last 50 years. Adele. I would add to that um, that the law, most preservation laws and the 1966 Preservation Act that sets up a definition for the National Register says architectural, historical, or cultural significance. There's a real weakness in the history of historic preservation because the cultural category has been so little exercised. Um, in when the designations are made. And it's not a capital C. It is, in fact, what um, Roseanne was talking about and Jamie. It's the association with the place and what is done there and so on. So I think this is a really big advance that that, that could be used to cover, that, that word can be used to to cover the appreciation that is being um, shown for what it means to people in a very, very simple way. And that this is a major improvement in the exercise of the law and the way the existing environment is being looked at. That it doesn't have to be architecturally significant. I mean, there are very good reasons why this was shied away from in the in the early days is because they really people felt the, that they were on the firmest ground when they were talking about architectural significance because uniqueness is easier to prove than cultural significance I mean this kind of thing so I think that's a defensible um, history but it's a great relief to have these other things entering in to the consciousness of why things have to be saved, it seems to me. Thank you. And I think at that point, we're going to end our, our panel. Thank you very much to all the panelists. <laughs>